It is truly a blessing to gather here today, bringing together all of our diverse voices in this, this chorus of praise as we remember the powerful story of Pentecost. This is a day that marks divine encounters and remarkable manifestations of the Holy Spirit. But hiding behind all the marvel and all the miracles in this momentous event, there is something common, something mundane and ordinary, embarrassing and inevitable. I'm I'm talking about that moment when Peter is just completely misunderstood and absolutely mistaken for some day-drinking drunkard. And not just Peter, but, but all of his buddies too. Uh, I guess misery loves company, but this, there's something that we understand about this text because in this moment, we all know what it feels like to be completely misunderstood. I believe each of us can relate to Peter in this instant. At least, I hope so, uh, because if not, it's just me. Um, though, though I do hope that none of you understand what it's like to be mistaken for a drunkard at 9 a.m. So let's lower our expectations from that. But somewhere in the middle, I, I think we can all understand what it means to be mistaken and misunderstood like the disciples here. Um, I'll put myself on the chopping block and tell you a story of a time that I was gravely misunderstood. And it, I didn't even do... Oh, it's not my fault. So uh, in, in college... I had the great misfortune of being in a car wreck with one of my classmates. And it wasn't bad, nobody was really hurt, it wasn't nothing traumatic. Um, the, the police officer who showed up thought it was hilarious because we knew each other, and he laughed and said, I'm not going to give you a ticket, this is punishment enough, and so it's, everybody was fine. Um, small town, Abilene, and um, people say different kinds of words about car wrecks. Some people call them wrecks, some people call them crashes. Um, sometimes you use the word hit to describe what happens in a car wreck. Well, I came to class the next day, and class was fine, and everybody already knew that we were in a car wreck with one another. And my professor called me up after class and sat me down in his office and said, we need to have a serious chat. There's a story going around that you hit this person from your class. And I couldn't even get out an explanation before the tirade began about how unethical it was for me to be hitting people and how violence is not an ever an answer to a solution to a problem and turns out the dean had been involved and long story short um, pretty much everybody on campus thought there was an actual physical fist fight between the two of us um, and I, I crawled in a hole and died um, and everybody thought that I was this violent thing and I don't, I don't understand. I, wakes me up at 2am, still don't understand. Um, it's just those kinds of moments haunt us, I think. They stick with us. And, and here is Peter, good stand-up Peter, who's coming off of another embarrassing moment where he denied Jesus not too long before, and he finally has some bravery. He's imbued with this power from the Holy Spirit, and everybody thinks he's just a drunkard. Um, and not just him, but all of his buddies. And, and I think that's, that's something we all understand. Um, but unlike me, Peter doesn't just shrink back in embarrassment. He, he challenges this moment. He pushes back. He clarifies. When others fail to grasp the truth about who we are or the intentions behind our words, our actions, it's disheartening for at least the average one of us. It's just discouraging. And I don't blame the crowd for assuming the disciples had been drinking before they considered the work of the Holy Spirit. I mean, on the list of things that can cause this to happen, um, drinking probably is on the top of everybody's list, and the work of the Holy Spirit is somewhere further down. I, when was the last time you were driving by and you saw somebody on the side of the road that looked like they'd been drinking and thought, clearly, this is the work of God's Spirit in this person? It's just, it's, it's not what you do. You're going to think alcohol is involved long before anything else. However, within this accusation um, lies a profound juxtaposition There's a contrast here that invites us to explore this concept of drinking, but in a whole new sense. Um, If you look closely at Acts chapter 2, just just verses 14 through 18, you can see something in the story that challenges the misconception surrounding the disciples and their behavior, this idea that they've been day drinking. Uh, And it opens the door to understanding something profound about this 
transformative power of the Holy Spirit. And just notice Peter's response as he steps forward, not backwards, but steps forward. And notice and pay close attention to what the disciples have been drinking. Um, it'll slip by if you, don't, if you don't notice it, but it's there, what they've been drinking other than alcohol. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, it will be, God declares, that I will pour out, there it is, that's, that's it, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. As Peter denies this accusation of drunkenness, he does not deny that they have been drinking. He denies they've been drinking alcohol. And he clarifies that the only drink they have consumed is the Holy Spirit of God that has been poured out. That is the drink of Peter and the Eleven. And throughout Scripture, there is this recurring metaphor of spiritual food and drink. Just open your Bible and your odds are you're going to find one on the page, the page around it. It's just, it's just kind of everywhere. From Genesis to Revelation, we find references to this nourishment of God's Word and the pouring out of God's Holy Spirit. Jesus teaches us that we cannot live on bread alone, but by every word. Isaiah 44 envisions a future age when God will pour water on the thirsty land and pour God's Spirit on a parched people. Jesus blesses those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. In Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and John, all encouraged God's people to eat God's word. And some of those stories are weird, and there's actual scrolls that get digested, and Eugene Peterson wrote a great book on this called Eat This Book, um, which sounds like you're supposed to eat the book instead of read it, but you can do both. Um, <laughs> all throughout scripture, everywhere you look, God invites us to partake of God's word and to drink of God's Holy Spirit. Pentecost is one of those significant moments when Peter denies that they've been drinking alcohol, but instead affirms that they have been drinking deeply from the Holy Spirit that has been poured out upon the disciples. And the truly remarkable thing about Peter drinking of the Holy Spirit instead of alcohol, the, the true mind-blowing fact, if Peter's been drinking of anything, is that regardless of what Peter and the disciples have been drinking, the result is the same. It doesn't matter if they've been drinking alcohol, it doesn't matter if they've been drinking of the Spirit. To everybody else around them, the two look interchangeable. Their behavior changes in such a way that it stands out as absolutely abnormal. Drinking of the Holy Spirit makes these 12 men look like they've been drinking since last night. And it's intriguing to me how both drunkenness and the manifestation of God's Spirit can somehow appear similar enough to cause this confusion. That's not normal. Even if you think that you have a grasp on what it means for God's Spirit to be drank deeply enough that you end up acting like Peter and the other 11, would you have ever imagined that God's Spirit would make you appear to everyone else like you're just another drunkard? because that's what it looked like. That's what it was. When I think of what the manifestation of the Holy Spirit looks like, I think of Cane Ridge, and I think of weird stories about speaking in tongues and barking and running around in circles, or I think even in scripture of, um, pick a story, how about Saul? Saul is, is not known for a lot of great moments, but one of his best is this weird little story where Saul, um, is sent to meet up with some prophets on the road, and he finds these other prophets, and they are in some sort of prophetic frenzy. 
whatever that means. And they appear to be acting just as drunk as the 12 on the day of Pentecost. And Saul joins in, and then everybody else thinks Saul is a prophet, and Saul is a weird acting drunk guy. And, and this prophetic frenzy is clouded in this mystery, but it doesn't, look, it doesn't look like speaking in tongues. It looks drunk. It looks chaotic. It looks wrong. Or what about Hannah? Um, Hannah is another good example here. Hannah is fervently praying for a child in the temple. And you would think that praying in the temple would be behavior that the priest would understand and recognize. But Hannah is praying so differently that the priest thinks she's drunk too. She's just sitting there talking to herself without any sound. She's just mumbling and muttering like a crazy person. And it's not that she's drunk, it's that she's completely in the spirit of God. And you see this later in the book of Acts, too. You see the apostles overcome by the Holy Spirit, and they start speaking not their own words, but the words of God in behalf of all of Christendom to the powers of Rome. And nobody understands this. It just looks unexpected. That's not the way God's power manifests. It just makes you look crazy, apparently. It makes you look chaotic. It makes you look out of control, unpredictable. In each of these instances, individuals are overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit, and they act in a way that stands out not just as atypical, but wrong to those who just don't understand what's going on. Hannah has to defend herself. Samuel records that, I guess, Saul's a prophet and nobody knows what to do with these people who, when they act like this. And so the whole crowd at Pentecost looks at the 12 and says, they, these guys look like they're drunk. It's a great party. Um, that, that makes the most sense. And they don't know how to categorize what they're experiencing. It's why the crowd on that first Pentecost struggled so much to explain the behavior they were witnessing. And so they settled on drunkenness. There's just something profoundly transformative, I guess, in drinking of the Holy Spirit. Something that changes who we are. But not just changes who we are, it changes what we say, how we act, and not just in any direction, but specifically in a way that the world just can't help but notice as weird. It's just weird. Today, that transformative power of the Holy Spirit remains just as true, just as active as it was all those years ago on Pentecost. The end result may differ, but the power remains constant. Just as Peter and the disciples drank of God's Spirit and began speaking in tongues, today we drink of God's Spirit and we feast on God's Word and although we do not speak in tongues or dream dreams or have visions, we are still equally transformed and changed by encountering and consuming and internalizing God's presence. And our present Pentecost, drinking of God's Spirit, empowers us to live out our faith boldly in a way that catches the attention of the world around us. And it might even appear odd or nonsensical. Um, I'll tell you some stories. Um, Same year that I had that car wreck in college, I was um, checking out some customer with some groceries. Um, it It was two people. They had just come in two minutes before the store was closing. And so I had to stay late because they were taking their time to collect their groceries and they wanted to do the full week of shopping. And so everybody else got sent home and I'm the last one there. And I'm checking out these, this very nice older couple with their groceries and they make small talk, my favorite thing in the world. And they want to ask questions of who are you? What are you doing in Abilene? Do you go to school here? And so I tell them who I am. I go to ACU and I tell them that I'm a ministry major and they want to hear all about that. And Um, Long story short, it took me at least 30 minutes to check out their groceries, not because I was slow, but because they just wouldn't stop talking. And right when I think I'm done, (laughs) and I think I'm finally going to get to go home and do the homework that I haven't done yet, and then go to bed at like three, um, I think think I'm in the clear. And this couple (laughs) looks at me differently. 
and she grabs my hand and she says, I'm going to pray for you. And I said, that, that's, thank you, that's great. And I thought she meant later, but she meant right now. <laughs> Wasn't done yet. And she prayed over me and my future in ministry. Um, and then when she was done, I'll never forget it, she looked me dead in the eye and I thought she looked right into my soul. And it was the weirdest, weirdest experience. And, and she said, I just know that you're going to do wonderful things. And what do, you, what do you say to that? I said, I said thanks. <laughs> I hope so. And, and she left. Um, and before they left, they turned around at the door, because I'm still not done. <laughs> they turned around at the door and they said, we'll be back to check on you. And I thought, that's really creepy. <laughs> and um, I never saw them again for the rest of my life. Haven't, not yet, anyway. Haven't seen them since. Kind of expect them to show up one day. <laughs> um, you know, she seemed like she really meant it, but I haven't seen them since. I'm not saying that's a Hebrews 13 moment. I'm not going to read too much into this, but that behavior was just not normal. It's not what people normally do, except it turns out it is. You just don't hear people talking about it. Um, this, two weeks ago, I was listening to Air One Christian Radio, and they had somebody call in with a story that was just like mine. This random person was in a grocery store parking lot, so it's a little bit different, but it's mostly the same. Grocery store parking lot, and they'd had a really hard day, and they were putting their groceries away, and some random woman walked up to them and said, it looks like you could use some prayer. And they didn't ask, they just started praying. Um, and then they became good friends, and they kept up with one another, and they kept in touch, and that person really did need prayer that day, and we're going through a very hard time in their life. And then all of a sudden, the radio starts ringing at the radio station, I guess, or the phone does, and everyone starts calling in with all the same stories of random strangers who have prayed with them in public in moments when they needed it most, and they never asked for it, but it's just hundreds of these stories of people who were just minding their own business when other people came up and wanted to pray with them. There was no speaking in tongues, there was no dreaming dreams, there were no visions being had, but you're going to be hard-pressed to convince me that's not Pentecost in a modern day. That is what it looks like for Christians to drink deeply of the Holy Spirit and be moved to reach out to strangers and pray with them. I mean, these days, praying for somebody without asking for their permission first, uh, that's, that's dangerous ground, isn't it? We'd be scared to do such a thing. What if people misunderstood us? What if we were misinterpreted? What if we misunderstood the situation? What if we misinterpreted someone else and we said, we think you look like prayer, and it turns out that's the best day they've had in 10 years. Now you've just insulted them. That's, it's scary stuff. But I think that's what Pentecost looks like. I think today on this Pentecost, we should each think seriously about drinking deeply of the Holy Spirit which has been poured out on all of us as much as it was on those 12 all those years ago. And to think deeply about dwelling within our hearts with the Holy Spirit and letting that change who we are, how we behave, how we act, what we say. Maybe that doesn't mean you go up to strangers and start praying with them. But it will probably mean that no matter what it looks like for you, Drinking of God's Spirit is going to change how you act in a way that makes you different. It's a transformative power. It's going to change something about your life. And you're probably not going to like it. But you're probably going to need it. So I think all of us should drink deeply of that well. If you've never done that before, if you've never surrendered yourself over to God like that, to the transformative power of the Holy Spirit, today is just as good as tomorrow. And we'd love to talk to you about that. You can grab me, you can grab one of the elders, you can grab somebody who looks like they know what's going on, or just grab somebody random. I'm sure that they'll, after this sermon, nobody's going to say no to you. It's going to be the power of the Holy Spirit, and we can say no. If you find yourself spiritually famished on this Pentecost, or thirsty for the Word, or parched for the Spirit, the elders, me, we're all available to talk to you about that too and try to get you nourished. But no matter where you are, where you sit on this Pentecost, if you think I'm just another crazy drunkard like Peter, it doesn't matter. When you come to that table this morning, 
I want you to remember Paul's words in Ephesians 5. He said, don't get drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no wine on the table this morning. It's grape juice, I promise. But either way, on this Pentecost, be filled with the Holy Spirit and let it take hold and take root in your heart and may it change you and make you act like an absolute weirdo in public because somebody else around you probably needs you to be more weird than they are and they need you to be there for them and they need God's Spirit in their life and that's not normal but nothing about what we do is truly normal. And as you leave this place of worship, and as you venture out into the world, let your actions and behavior be so distinctive that others are compelled to ask you what in the world you're doing and why you would do it. And when they do ask, and they will, I pray that the boldness of Peter be in you, that you don't shrink away in fear of being misunderstood, but that you step forward and that you tell them it's just the Spirit of God moving within you. Let's stand and sing.